Imagine seeking out a tribe of cannibals and knowing the last foreigner to do so had never returned. Dr. Lawrence Blair was climbing aboard pirate ships, descending into active volcanoes, getting stranded in thick, uncharted jungles, and flying to meet a meditation guru in a country where genocide was brutalizing the population. Along with his brother Lorne, adventures like these were all part of their journey as documentary filmmakers. They went to extraordinary lengths to capture the human spirit and to uncover the depths that bind us all together, no matter how unique and different our lives may appear. Both brothers found their home in Bali, Indonesia, where sadly, Lorne passed away some years ago. But Lawrence is as active as ever. His books and films have been a huge inspiration to me, and it was an absolute honor to share an hour of his time for this interview. Hey guys, welcome to Bent Planet, where I tell you true stories of humans in abnormal predicaments. Tales that will twist your mind. And this interview is no exception. If you love hearing true stories, subscribe and hit the notification bell so I can keep telling them to you. All right, get comfortable. Are you ready to hear a story? Lawrence, so ah, happy to have you here. Good to be here. <laughs> so good to meet you. I've been familiar with who you are for a number of years. When I was first coming to Bali, I saw the Ring of Fire on my cousin's bookshelf and it inspired me to travel a lot more around Indonesia. So I have, have you to thank for that. And there's so many areas which I could dive into, but I'm just going to go straight for one jugular. Going to New Guinea to meet the cannibals. How do you set something up like that? I mean, to explore to a part of the world, it was in the 70s, so it was in a time when way out of digital communication with other people. How do you even begin to set something up like that um, with any kind of safety parameter, let alone communicating with those people and letting them understand why you're there? Well, not much safety parameter at all, of course, but we first went through the missionaries because there was a bishop. He says of the smallest bishopric in the world, but of course it's a useful thing because if a bishop gets eaten by cannibals, it gets a lot of publicity. So he would normally have been a priest, but they made him a bishop because he had a high a chance of getting eaten by cannibals there. And there were several other uh, members of this particular religious community, a Dutch community, who were based in Agats, which was the capital of this enormous territory, Asmat territory, and it was a pretty down-at-heel kind of one-horse place, except there are no horses can survive. They get eaten sooner than human beings in New Guinea. And uh, so we got quite a lot of our information from them, but they didn't tell us everything. They didn't tell us that the Dutch had, in fact, gone in there in 1958 to put down a headhunting war, and they'd finished up shooting a few of the local people, four of the local people. So it's the first time the white man ever came into the cycle of revenge. And, of course, Michael Rockefeller did disappear there before we arrived and after that took place. And he 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 was literally the... the, Before you went in there, he was the last... Yes, yes he was. ...foreign white man to actually go and make contact with them. Absolutely. Right. And at that point, was it known that he'd been killed by them or it was just a grey area? It was a grey area. And the priests actually had a good idea that they had... They didn't want us to go to this village of Ochenep at all for the very reason that they suspected he had been killed and eaten by the Ochenepes there. Um, But, of course, anywhere... The the place that was least recommended was exactly where we wanted to go because we were documentary filmmakers and it only made sense to us to make films about things that hadn't been done before or that were the most interesting or were the most dangerous what we did in those days yeah and that that thirst like to get into that area and talk to them was driven by what exactly i mean clearly you know when it comes to adventure and you know living a full life and all that kind of thing i mean you just anyone that has that in their veins really does seek out crazy situations i feel like i've had that all my life too in 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 terms of just wanting to fill my life and look back over it like a book but Mm. but you you guys like you know the there's no there's no boundaries to how far you guys took that. And so that particular 
expedition was was pushed by what sort of thirst exactly? Was it? Well, they hadn't been filmed these people before. That's one thing. And then when we had a look at the ones that were coming into the town, well, it wasn't even a town; it was a big village. Although it was the capital of this whole region of Agats, we thought, God, these guys are amazing. I wonder what they're like in living in their own villages. Mm. So we were dead keen to get there. And uh, we were lucky because my brother and I, with whom I made all these films, as you know, my dear late brother, who was really the driving force behind it. I was really only just his bag carrier oh, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but uh, he, he uh, we were both brought up in Mexico. Our parents emigrated from England to Mexico when I was 14 and he was 11. So we were brought up. We learned the language fairly quickly because we went to the local schools and everything. So we were always foreigners, strangers in a strange land and quite quickly learned to not give a damn about what people thought about our differences. And so the world was open to us there. We would go down and hang out with and live in Indian villages. My brother led at the age of 18 his first expedition for three months down something called the Usumacinta River to try and find these Lakandon Indians at a time. And uh, we didn't hear from him for a long time, of course, and he came out with this amazing footage as an 18-year-old. And so when we came to Indonesia, it seemed like Mexico multiplied by 100 And uh, never left, of course. There's still so much to film, so much to explore, so much Mm. to discover here. Uh, Not all the tribal peoples have handphones. Yeah. So the the initial discovery of Indonesia, to even look at it as a place to come and explore, was that, I mean, you you say it was based on the book by Wallace and his explorations here. Was it... it was that the singular moment? The kind well, of well, not not so much that. It was, we were involved in a meditational group in Mexico uh, before it was trendy. Before the Beatles had uh, followed Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and our guru happened to be in Java. So my first trip, in fact, my brother's first trip as well to Indonesia was as a delegate to a spiritual conference in Jakarta. It turned out to be the year of living dangerously, sixty-five. Yeah. So it was really hairy in the streets of Jakarta, and we yeah. never got down here it was even hairier Uh, but it uh, was our introduction to Indonesia having arrived here one got a taste of and began reading then and realised how enormous and fascinating it was and then one of the early books we did read about Indonesia was indeed Alfred Russell Wallace's describing his adventures in the 1850s, uh, the Malay Archipelago, which is still the classic on the whole of Indonesia. It's a wonderful book to read, especially if you're sailing, as I still do quite often, amongst all these some 17,000 islands. Mm. He, his observations totally stand up. Yeah, so that that meditation you were grouped, to go back to that the meditation group you were with, was that the Subab? Yes. It was. So you were, okay, so you were already involved in that in Mexico. Yes. So it had already stretched to there. And the yes. guy that began that meditation group was a Javanese guy. That's right. He's an, he was an accountant and then he's wandering one, along one night with mm. his friends and mm. he has a sudden unbelievable mm. moment where... He, he, he has an amazing revelation where, where, which the people with him also saw, which is unusual, which is described as like a, a, a bolt of slow lightning that comes down on top of him and other people saw it and they thought it was just an electrical phenomena and he felt it completely and he thought he was dying and he decided, well, he's got two options. He either fights it, and that wasn't getting him very far, or he surrenders to it and lets go to it completely, which is what he did, and he found that he was filled by it when he did that, and that with an effort of will he could stop being penetrated by whatever this energy was. And then he found that later on in the day, well, in the evening to be precise, if he surrendered or put his mind in that particular space just for a moment, it would fill him again. And it would also fill other people in his presence who were prepared to receive it. So it had no theology attached to it at all. It had no stories, none of the usual religious bullshit that goes with these things. But it was passed on like by contagion through people who were willing to experience this. And it was advised that you never did more than half an hour twice a week because it was so powerful it would flip you out. And sure enough, it spread around the world and it still is around the world very discreetly in many places, including London. So it reached you in Mexico because there were people there that that were practising it. Yes. So every every body that was converted to this concept, uh, it's a meditative concept, right? Meditation concept. it's a meditation. So everyone that was converted to it had to have come in contact with someone else who was already practising it and passing it on. That's right. So how did you 
first hear about it and how did it how was it passed on to you through my family uh, my parents were involved in it before my brother and I were and uh, what you do is if you decide to be involved I don't like it conversion isn't really the right it sounds a bit religious conversion mm. you don't get converted to tennis exactly you go <laughs> and play it and if you like it you carry on playing it yeah. but it is just a pure meditational technique you don't have to change your religion you can remain whatever religion you were beforehand you might indeed have no religion at all but it seems to have the same effect on people's inner selves that water and sunlight has on plants and uh sometimes after a while when you've been practicing for a while it will begin doing you and if it's an in, in an inconvenient place you stop it and sometimes it just happens you can allow it to go mm. now this was a very useful thing for my brother and myself when you know we became involved in all these years of really data gathering for the field of psychoanthropology which was trying to reach contact live with tribes who ideally hadn't been contacted even by their own governments or by missionary groups because when we were there not able to speak their language and they weren't able to speak ours you could just sit and go into this state and they would know where you were coming from because a lot of indonesians more then than now were perfectly capable of going into that state because they are profoundly religious people and yeah. have had meditational techniques been exposed to them since childhood it's interesting because i guess for a lot of people that explore not just science but like as you did actually explore territory and and come across new people that they've never met before or who haven't ever met people from the outside world a lot, often people go in with a lot of, I mean, clearly a lot of force. Like, um, you know, there's an, there's an agitated, like uh, almost too much enthusiasm to go in and find out what's going on. So they go in with that kind of force. And, and like with anything, like a, like a sales rep knocking at your door, if someone comes in with too much force and enthusiasm to make a sale, you can read that person, right? right? So you're going to feel like you're going to want to block them and push them That's out. Right. But it's interesting that, yeah, as you said, like that, that root, human element that binds us all across every four corner all four corners of the globe that inner thing within us all i guess if you're Definitely. really harboring that and taking that on board and going across to meet people with that in mind then you're connecting with them on that level and they're Absolutely. reading that from you Absolutely. and you see as we always explain to them what we were there for was to capture their world their way that we respected it that we were really dead keen on understanding how they lived and please would they just give us everything they've got in the way of interpreting how they lived. Mm. And most people respond positively to that. Yeah. Uh, it was... Uh, it was uh, the, the other thing is, of course, uh, people often ask how come that you came out of these situations unscathed. And the reason is there were most of the, th the films were done by just my brother and myself, so we were such a small team... Our defence was in our vulnerability. Mm. Had we been, as occasionally we were, three or even four people, we were automatically another tribe. So you really noticed that that difference so. between the two, and then just just additional Very much people. So. And what what would you say were is up there with one of the most, or some of the most scary moments in terms of not really knowing which way a situation is going to go. Well, do you know, I tell you, the people who were most frightening from our point of view were the ones who wore uniforms. Mm. Amongst the tribal peoples, we were adopted by the Azmat people, and although they were pretty crazy and a little bit quick to temper, you knew where they were coming from all the time. Can you, you just describe to them. those people, the Azmat people? Well, there was, one, there was one fellow, one of our adopted fathers, because there were four of us down there at one point, and uh, one of them... Uh, he, he asked, we asked and we could do, could do this through an interpreter there was always one person who spoke enough Indonesian and the remotest tribes because that's their trading language and that's how they trade with other people uh, we asked him how many children he had and he said he had four children and his wife said no you've got three now you remember you got angry and you threw one on the fire <laughs> You forget about that, babe. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. So, I, yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense, you know, like if uh, not the throwing a child in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can, you I can, must have children I can, too. I can, I can understand it from some points of view. But, uh, no, the, the whole thing about uniforms, I mean, that's actually 
even when I look back at all the times I've been travelling and the times I've felt most vulnerable and most in a situation where it could go either way, it's often when someone feels like their authority is challenged in any way. Not that you, you're you scarier than them because they've probably got a gun in their pocket or whatever, um, but it's just an ego thing, mm. I guess. It's a power thing when someone's And they could have busted our films completely and sent us packing, sent us yeah. home, which would have embarrassed us deeply with all our investors and all mm. the people waiting for us to come back. And in the early days, of course, Indonesia didn't want us to make films about their tribal people. They thought that's just showing a shameful, primitive side of them. They wanted us to film new bridges and new roads and things like that. So we actually had to come in with our cameras and equipment in little pieces and then put them together after we'd come inside here. What a here. mission. And what an interesting irony that they want you to see the technology side of, the, of Indonesia and the advanced side of Indonesia to show the rest of the world. But actually, as documentary makers, you were looking for the very opposite. You were looking for what actually dis- disregards all of that and gets us back to a raw humanity. Right. And I mean, right. I mean, that's been a really strong theme and a strong... Um, value for you throughout your life and in terms of what you've been looking for and wanting to, to learn and then teach That's right. is this whole concept, right, of, um, of what lies in that grey area between science and then the, the things that are unexplained and yet apparent. That's right. Um, which I, I just find absolutely, absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's, it's such a tough subject because it, there's always this huge area full of woo-wah and, um, and, and in er- areas that can be ridiculed because they can't be proven. But then you've just got so much that, that you can bear witness to mm. and, and you can be in a room and experience something and be mm. absolutely certain that it happened and that you saw it. Definitely. But then you look for an explanation mm. and science will laugh at you and say, well, prove that it mm. happened. And, and I mean, science can't pin down dreams. You know, we're all driven by dreams yeah. and we all have them whether we like it or not. Mm. Yeah, and I mean you've you've experienced so many things like that, like the guy um, Dynamo uh, Jack. Is that the the guy that lit the fire? That's the, right. The, the we called him Dynamo Jack, and I right. thought you were going to mention him when you began by you know the two things that stand out. One is living with the cannibals, mm. and the other one is definitely DJ or Dynamo Jack, as we called him, and we called him by this name because he didn't want his real name or his address given out because he said that. As soon as a Westerner sees what he does on camera, they will think he's a liar. And when he tells them that everybody could learn this if they put the time and the effort into it, then he would think. Then people would think he was a liar as well as a trickster. So why bother? Um, he and didn't how want did, to be filmed? How did you first come to meet him? We were making a film about six or seven months worth, traveling all over Java and Sumatra and Bali and Sulawesi, looking for wise men, magicians, mystics, which is what Indonesia claimed to be pretty strong in. And we found a vast amount of people. We found a a lot of charlatans. And we found some of the real McCoy, of whom very few were prepared to appear on camera, which, of course, makes the Western... Uh, cynic in everybody say, oh, well, of course he doesn't want to appear on camera. He's a charlatan. Ironically, though, I find that the people that have the loudest voices in Western society usually represent the worst part of a group, (laughs) whereas the ones that are the most stable and solid and have the most to say are usually the ones that sit in the background and just quietly wait for you to ask. (laughs) Absolutely, (laughs) absolutely. Well, this is one of these rare creatures who happened to be, although I don't say it in the book and I don't say it in the films, he was one of the healers of the president at the time, uh, Suharto, who had about four special healers, but this was the magician healer. And there is a tradition of that in Indonesia that the kings have their healers mm. and of different types for different reasons. So he was he was well known. He just didn't yes. go around blagging. Yes. About, yeah. And you see, on one occasion, my brother and I, for those who don't know what we're talking about, by the way, this is a man who claims to have practiced a type of qigong, which is a Chinese technique for recognizing the flow, the distinction in the flow between yin and yang energy in your body, which once it's recognized can then be manipulated if you practice long enough and know what you're doing. And it can be used for the martial arts or it can be used for healing. And he chose it for healing and he learned it as, as, as a youngster. 
from a Chinese, um, but he was from here in Indonesia, and he had this incredible ability. He said everybody can learn it. He said, but you know, everybody could learn how to play the violin, but for quite a lot of people, it wouldn't mm. be worthwhile. Yeah, uh, but a few people are really good at it, and he happened to be really good at this technique. And he could do a whole pile of things with this manipulation of yin and yang. Um, he could ignite things as in igniting the newspaper that we see on camera in Ring of Fire. I've seen that on numerous occasions. He even did it in a hotel, a five-star hotel room in Jakarta, and then quickly picked up the glowing ashes and put them in a waste paper basket before they burn through the carpet. But the, it, all of which you might say could be trick. He could also pull things into his hand. I had a very sceptical uh, camera assistant on this occasion, and... Dynamo Jack asked for a cigarette when we first met him. We were sitting on this big sofa. And disdainfully, my cameraman threw this pack of his cigarettes at him, thinking he has another Indonesian guy asking for a cigarette. And Dynamo Jack was a bit pissed off. And he pointed his hand at it, he went like this, and he drew it into his hand. Wow. Which completely blew my brother and, and him away. I mean, that, that would just blow anyone would. away. I mean, that's, that's one of those things. I, I literally watched a video um, a few nights ago of somebody setting up a bunch of aluminium foil and then, you know, doing this meditation thing and pushing the mm. foil away. Now, could easily have been a trick um, mm. and, you know, your 99.9% .9 of your brain says it is a trick and mm. all the comments on the video are saying, mm. oh, he's just doing this or that or trying this. And then interestingly, some of the comments were saying, if you really want to prove it, try pulling them towards you, which is funny that you just mentioned that. But to have sat in a room mm. with someone doing that, let alone lighting. So just to explain to those listening, he, he was crumpling up paper, putting it on the ground and then basically... Yeah. meditating or focusing on it from a distance. Yeah, he goes into a sort of state over it. He points his hand at it. He pops out with beads of sweat on his forehead and then, boom, he releases this energy which ignites it. Now, all these things, it can be, uh, can be repeated by professional magicians, by conjurers. But the point is he was working as a healer and it's when he touches your hand and says, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, boom, and gives you this enormous electric shock. You begin to wonder. Yeah, I remember the footage of your, was it your sound woman? or one Yes. Of, yeah, who, who also wanted to feel that energy. That's right. And, and she was pushing against his stomach or That's something. That's right. And he, and he kept That's one of the force. powerful chakras just below his navel, uh, which is where you condense this energy. And uh, she, 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 she got a, quite a burn from it. Wow. He gave her a big shot. And you see, on an, in another film, I did a series also called Myths, Magic and Monsters for Sky TV UK, where we use more of the footage. And also I went back and filmed him again with a group of people who came in from the States, scientists, philosophers, um, to see if he was for real or not. And they reckoned they were going to be able to uncover him as a trickster in no time whatsoever. But he was shortly collapsing them at the knees, literally. Uh, and they, complete, they came in with gauss meters and all sorts of things to see that he didn't have any implants in him. We well, took him to a hotel room, which was a clean room, which none of us had been to before to see if there was any setup in it. Nothing like that. And shortly... He was igniting, lighting LEDs, light-emitting diodes. And as you know, depending on how much force goes through them, they will light in different colors. Mm. And he was doing that. Uh, we had to ground him properly, and we were fooling around with uh, voltmeters to see what setting we had to have. But this guy was producing. We said, well, is this electricity? He says, no, it's chi. But in certain ways, it behaves like electricity. But I thought the most convincing thing was that, you know, that he, he, his sect didn't allow him to receive any payment at all. He could receive gifts, which is why his children were educated at university in California, gift from the president. Right. But uh, down in the villages, people brought him chickens and things like that. Uh, or nothing at all. It was okay if they couldn't afford it. It was perfectly okay. And the point is they kept on rolling up to be cured. And we all know a regular doctor, if he's no good... He's not going to have any patients. Yeah, of course. This guy had yeah. tons of them. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, there are so many people in this country with these wild abilities like that. And, I mean, you know, it's a massive task. Yep. Obviously, there are a lot of charlatans. I remember going 
um, I heard about a guy that could do that, could could uh, project chi and uh, was, would give massages using that technique and push basically electric volts through your body. I went to him, I was absolutely shocked at the amount of power that came out of this guy's body mm. but I was also very sceptical and, um, and I'm still... I feel like I uncovered what he was doing. I believe he was a charlatan. Mm. It, it was it was here in um, in Kuda, in uh, mm. Seven Yak. But he had a, a specific room set up with a bed on it and then I was lying down and as soon as he put his hands on my shoulders, it mm. was just bang, this incredible surge mm. of electricity mm. to the point where I was just literally in shock going, mm. how, how is this humanly possible? Mm. And then he did that all over my body and, you know, he would like touch my leg and my whole leg would mm. just, just push out in this extreme reaction to vaults but when he walked out of the room for a moment I jumped off the bed and just look I just wanted to see and I realized it's a very solid bed and below the bed there was a huge big metal plate on, in the floor ah. and I noticed he yeah. wore bare feet and I was and I'm quite certain that what he was doing was slipping his shoes yeah. off putting his foot on the plate and then creating a circuit Highly likely because I know that exists here as well and mm. people who claim to have this energy are indeed using that little setup. Yeah, yeah. Now with Dynamo Jack, for what he's worth, I remember we were in this five-star hotel. I met him there because he was actually dealing with the president there mm. and that's the easiest way to do it. Rather than bring this guy to the palace, they, they met in the hotel. But I went up a lift, one of those circular lifts which had windows and you could see the whole foyer down below. and um, it was circular and there was a circular bar to hold on to like inside the lift, like a safety bar thing. And we were all leaning against that. And he electrocuted us or cheed us all. And we all leapt forward and he howled with laughter. It was one of his little jokes. Wow. But it would have been very hard to set up one of those plates that you're describing yeah. in a lift that we'd just walked into. Yeah, I mean, even everything you've described about him, I mean... That's the thing. A charlatan is often someone that tries that copies what is you yes. know what some people could do, and then they em emulate it to try and make money out of it, right? Yeah. And this guy was doing exactly that. But mm. I mean, I didn't even realize that um, that the guy you're talking about had actually been tested by all these people mm. and sort of flabbergasted mm. by what he could do. That's right. Yeah. There's. there's <coughs> I remember there's a book. Um, what's his name again? Lyle Watson. Lyle Watson. Yeah. Uh, Good the, mate. The gift. Oh, I was going to ask if you knew him. Very yeah. much so. so. He wrote. He wrote the forward to my first book, Rhythms of Vision. Oh, he wrote the forward to and it. And oh. in it, he describes and puts in print for the first time the hundredth. Oh, the hundredth monkey. monkey. Yeah, right. absolutely. Okay, I didn't realize that was him actually. Yeah, he's I didn't a wonderful. Get... He was a wonderful guy. Unfortunately, we've lost him too. But right. all his books were absolutely amazing. Yeah, his. Book, which one the, are you talking about? Ah, uh, the gift of unknown things. Yes. Yeah. Which you know is to me has a really similar. Um, vein to your adventures. It's this, it's this kind of. I mean, he sort of seemed to go to get caught in a situation where his scientific mind battled more with the idea of mystical stuff. That's right. And he went in sort of wanting to prove it wrong. Mm. And then, um, for those that aren't familiar with the book, it's it's a book where this guy basically gets gets shipwrecked, gets marooned on an island with uh, in Indonesia, and his and his you know his whole mind thinks scientifically, and then all of a mm. sudden he's Caught living in a situation for up to a year or something, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Um, with these people that completely rely on mysticism and and um, sort of magical practices, I guess, and ritualistic sort of ideas um, to inspire whether it's rice harvests or just you know a anything to do with birth and death and all these kinds of things. Mm. And um, all the things that matter. Yeah, and uh, and over time, he not only starts to see that they they have effect and that they literally work. But he starts to also really look at it in a scientific frame of mind and see the correlation of how it ac could actually work. I remember one one example is when they're doing the um, – it's the rice harvest when they're first planting all the seeds of the rice and the uh, – I don't want to say shaman, but this priest, I guess, of, yeah. the, of the village, is up there with a huge gong, sort of just with a with a big um, a drumstick in his hand, and sort of over time they're all chanting, and he's just slowly swaying more and more until he starts to get this rhythm in his bones, and then finally he just takes that stick and starts hitting the gong um, at a certain sort of beat, at a certain tempo, and then yeah, what Lyle sort of established later was that actually he was basically starting to feel the, the, 
the Earth's, literally the Earth's pulse, its mm. rhythmic pulse. Mm. And then by it hitting... It has a frequency, It's yeah. frequency, yeah. And then by hitting that gong at that specific time and sending those sound waves out across the rice fields just as they were being planted, it literally... Mm. He was like, well, scientifically, this could actually be pushing the growth of those mm. seedlings. So, yeah, I find, like... Guys, it's amazing that. So I didn't realize you were you were close with him, but I was yeah, going to absolutely ask that, close yeah. because when I was writing my doctorate degree at Lancaster University in England, and I was living between times down in in London, um, you see, Lyle Watson was a scientist and began poaching on my territory of mysticism <laughs> and magic and legend, yeah. and I was based in that and was poaching in the area of science. So we had a great deal to discuss with each other, a great deal that the other could explain to each other. So it was a very fruitful sort of uh, relationship. And I met him under interesting circumstances when my brother and I were sailing on our first expedition in 1972 on a boogies prow with a boogies people uh, to the Aru Islands from Makassar, following the original course of Alfred Russell Wallace, who was the first Westerner ever to see alive the greater bird of paradise, we were in Banda Island. We hadn't seen another Westerner for months and months. And in Banda Island, there, swimming around uh, a boat that had just come in, was this white guy with a beard and these vivid blue eyes. And we asked, what the hell are you doing? And he says, oh, I am researching for the first... Lindblad Explorer expeditionary ships trips through these waters. We said, well, come aboard, have a drink, tell us what's going on. And we just had half an hour before he had to take, before he had to take off on his boat. And he was indeed, and he got us the job lecturing so on the Lyle, Lindblad that's Explorer. How you met that's Lyle how Walton. we met Lyle Watson. Oh, that is just brilliant. Swimming around in the water I love Banda. it that I was going to ask you your connection <laughs> with him, and that's the connection. That that's is it. just unbelievable. I yeah. mean... What a, what a what a perfect! Yeah. I thought you were going to say you met him like doing a talk at a conference no, or something, no. and someone said, "Oh, you've got to meet Lyle." <laughs> that is the most perfect way to meet him. I mean and, that. Yeah, sorry. And by him subsequently writing the forward to my book, a rather obscured book based on my uh, doctoral thesis, which probably nobody else would have ever read, <laughs> uh, it did incredibly well. It got me all over the world, you know, including to Australia, including to the United States. Yeah, wow. Well, I mean, just that that journey alone uh, that you went on. Uh, that was that the main drive for that was, or the main funding for that, I guess, was to capture footage of the bird of paradise that that had not been caught before. Is that the that? It had been dear old uh, David Attenborough, of course, it did everything in the forties, but it was in black and white. Right, yeah, in which is not so much stunning. good, is it? <laughs> the bird of paradise. <laughs> but uh, no, we we captured, I think, the first ever color footage of the greater wow. bird of paradise. And uh, it was a very romantic thing to do because, you know, we fell in love with this guy, Alfred Russell Wallace. I mean, mm. what a dude. Uh, just yeah. incredible what he did, you know. Eight years, far more vivid a life than Charles Darwin had. He learned all the, he learned the languages. He got incredibly sick here. He collected up to 125,000 different species that had never been seen before in Whoa, Europe. Huh? He expanded the Western mind's understanding of the variety of life on earth mm. and he did it alone well he, he had an assistant who helped stuff his animals is basically what it was and his greatest expedition was on a boogie's prow boogies you know who possibly gave the word boogie or bogeyman to the english language yeah that's the idea, so huh? terrified the first western explorers here they were literally rightly. pirates you know a yes, lot of them were pirates yes yeah. mm. And uh, so his great trip was in the 18... Well, it was about, I think it was about 1860s he travelled with them to the Aru Islands from Makassar, which is a long way, 1,500 miles perhaps, to see, be the first Westerner ever to see the Great of Bird of Paradise doing its mating dance. Wow. And he writes about it vividly and spectacularly. And so that's what drew us through here on our first mm. trip. We thought it was going to be only one trip... And then it turned out to be 10 years of filming, which is the basis of the series Ring of Fire. Yeah. So, I mean, you fell in love with Indonesia in a much deeper way than you expected, I yes. guess. Yes. Yeah. I mean, even just 
taking on an adventure like that, it's funny how as you go back, you know, like you go right back to, um, have you read that book, Nathaniel's Nutmeg? Yes. Yeah, so like even going back to that, you know, 17th century when the spice races were on and just how unbelievably dangerous those times were, whether you were Spanish fleets or... Or whoever, whoever you were with at the time, mm. you know, you've you've got you know other countries to fear. If you see a ship, then they're going to attack mm. you and try and steal all the spices. If you finally see another European, he's probably going to kill you. Yeah, or you know, and as you approach an island, I mean, either your your captain is a threat to them and is going to order you to just massacre all these poor innocent people as they come out to greet you, or the last people <laughs> did that and therefore those people are reacting to them and as they see you, they're going to come out and try and kill you first. Yes. I mean, it's just an insane amount of fear yeah. involved, you yeah. know, if the scurvy doesn't get you first or That's whatever. Right. So, you know, you've got those that sort of century of just insane... And then you've got, if you do manage to get into the forest, you've got creatures that nobody could have dreamt of. You've got 30-foot pythons, you've got salty crocodiles, you've got orang-utans, you know, eight times stronger than a single human being. I mean, it is a world of living dreams, is yeah. it not? Was there ever a, a threat in that outside of humans? What was sort of, what do you think were the greatest threats that you guys faced or moments of, of having your lives endangered by things outside of the human sphere? Well, definitely the weather in Borneo. In Borneo, you can only go in and explore it uh, in the rainy season when the rivers are full, which are the highways that enable you to get right up into the heart of Borneo. Mm. And that is the insect season as well. And so when we did our Dream Wanderers of Borneo trip, uh, we were in there for five months or something in the rainy season, and it was... Uh, what, there was a point when everything was flooding all around us and we could only envisage going up trees. Wow. Um, and our literally, dia- literally your camp is being flooded yes. and just waters are rising. That's right. We had hammocks, so we were lying in hammocks above the water beginning to pour through. And if it's gone up another metre or two, well, there's no way you can go. Wow. You don't want to swim around in the water. And when you climb trees, uh, you're not the only thing that's climbing the trees to get out of, of the water. Yeah. Uh, so that was Harry. And, of course, the other thing was on the boat, on that uh, boogie's prow, the following Alfred Russell Wallace's journey, it was not seaworthy. It wouldn't have been allowed to go to sea in any other country in the I world. Mean, that's, it had a yeah, wrong right. mainmast. It was coming apart at the seams and we were in really bad weather. We thought we were going down. Yeah, there's so many moments, like as I was watching that documentary, it's so easy when you're watching a documentary to kind of assume that the people making the documentary already have this awareness mm. that in the future they'll be showing everyone the documentary and therefore they have like a bit of a carefree where we're, we're going to be <laughs> fine right. because because you're watching it in post <laughs> you can't and you know they survived you kind of feel like they know they're going to survive too yes. because you're watching it right <laughs> but it's you have to remind yourself while you're watching it that while these people were making this yeah. this is a real danger and That's yeah right. w- watching that you know seeing that the mast of that ship was just so mm. dodgy, mm. and uh, and the, you know the storms you guys went through, and uh, I remember there was a guy on the boat that was uh, praying doing at the his, wrong time yeah, of the day, <laughs> doing his Muslim prayers way outside <laughs> of normal Muslim prayers hours, which is not a good sign. And even just the just the sheer uncomfortability of being, you know, sleeping in a boat that's just crawling mm. with cockroaches, mm. and mm. I remember the description that it sounded like it was all just, sorts of things, ants and rats and fascinating little things like you couldn't identify. They didn't have. English words for them. Yeah, that's just just. And wrong. I should mention before I forget, you know, we've just remastered this series, Ring of Fire, and it's available on uh, on uh, Apple. Y- is that uh, the one that's on Apple? Uh, that that is correct. Mm. Apple TV. Yeah, that's there what I, go. I just I just got it the other week um, to watch, watch oh, through it again. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, say say in Borneo, just to give people an an idea of how away from everything you are, like in that moment where you're being flooded, like how, how far away from society and help and people and like at that time are you? Because it's really hard for people these days to even get a concept of distance. I can tell you exactly 600 miles with no radio uh, because you didn't have radios then, no television, you didn't have any, I mean, any sort of, uh, what am I talking about? Telephones, nothing Mm. like that. So you were your own doctors and uh, your own survivalists. And uh, in fact, the way we got out of that, we already had made an arrangement with a missionary pilot several months beforehand saying, look, if you're here on this date, will you keep an eye out for us and pick us up? 
And they say, well, we don't have a, actually a, a landing strip there, but we are organizing one. We send people over land. We teach them how to make a little, just a hundred yards long landing strip for these things. And sometimes they work. Sometimes they work well enough to land a plane on them. Right. We didn't know our lives were going to depend on that wow. entirely. And we were close to the end of our tether, very hungry when we were rushing across. And then finally we heard the plane coming. Zzz, he came down, he circled. No good, not good enough. Couldn't land on it. Too wow. wet. Wow. So he pissed off again. For and then, <laughs> well, came in a couple more days later and he went on for days. And we would have to walk from this little village, we'd have to rush through the river and climb this little hill to where they had built this very rough Every time you strip. heard the plane. Every time you we had heard to the make plane. that journey. That's right. And then when eventually we could, he could land it, we could get in it, uh, and we got in and in the back there with our gear and everything. He brought his sandwiches, of course, for the day's flight, and it was as much as we could do not to just rip them physically out of his <laughs> hands. just starving. And eat them. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so every time you heard that plane, you have to get all your gear, race through the jungle and up over things to, to right. try and get to it. And then he takes off again and That's you right. miss him. And then you have no radio contact. You just have to think, well... Well, actually, he never, he never landed, you know, he... he, he he would circle us yeah. for like a, a week's worth of not being able to land. Yeah, so then he would go and That's you would right. have no... You would just no. be like, I guess we just Will go we back and wait again. Will we ever see him again? again? Yeah. That is, and what sort of footage did you get on that specific occasion to sort of make all that worthwhile and... None. <laughs> I was going to say, there must have been times <laughs> where you looked back and went, we literally didn't get anything to show for this whole no. adventure. Oh, well, well, we have the movie, but we just didn't have the the end of it, the really rough bit of being right, picked right. up by an aeroplane because we'd virtually run out of everything <laughs> okay. by then. And even then we were only dropped at another place where we still had to take canoes down river to get out. We weren't taken all the way back down to the... To the, to the coast again or anything yeah, like sure. that. Yeah, sure. So getting in that plane um, wasn't like a massive... It was just no. it was just one step in a huge right. journey. And, of course, the thing is you're shooting 16-millimeter film and uh, you have to be very careful of what you use because you might use it on something that's not any good, a ceremony or something that doesn't work, and you do not want to use footage that would then be usable for the absolute key and wonderful thing. So it's a tremendous decision all the time as to how much of it you you use and of course you lose a lot of it because it's humidity and light and everything it was very bad for 16 millimeter film so we would only take it out of the eskies at midnight unexposed film and put our exposed film into the esky uh, at midnight because then it was as cool as it was likely to be in the 24 hour period wow uh, but enough of it survived to bring you, rather an amazing you did speed. have one Really tragic moment, though, when you lost a lot of footage, right? When when a house that you were living in burnt down? That was in Los Angeles. In Los later, Angeles? Yes, yeah. So what, what was that footage mm. that you lost there? Well, it wasn't fortunately the footage because my brother was in London at the time looking after the film, but I was in Los Angeles in this rented house where I also worked with sacred geometry. It was one of my things, making sculptures out of lasers, and I was looking after all our thousands of slides still photographs that have been taken over our years of expeditions in Indonesia. And it was because I worked with lasers and holography, the rising sun came through unclosed drapes and ignited parabolic mirrors that sort of ignited the whole house with all these valuable slides in it. I was asleep at the time downstairs because you used to work with lasers, you would work all night and sleep during the day and two of my cats jumped on my face or rather one of them jumped on my face and I woke up and I heard this sound of fire above me. The studio was above my bedroom and I rushed upstairs and uh, naked, of course, and uh, there is fire popping up everywhere. And I look at the floor and the paint is bubbling already, but I had oh, wow. so much adrenaline in me, I didn't feel it at the time. I tried to grab the slides and they were already melting in their polyvinyl folders into one another. This is slides from like a, a long period of time? Yeah, long, oh. out of pr priceless situations in oh. amazing places that oh, had no. never been photographed before and this, that and the other, and wonderful treasures in the house. And um, 
basically I saw this stuff bubbling and I realised I'd probably find myself in the street rather shortly, so I better get some knickers on for a start. So I rushed down into my bedroom and already the ceiling I'd been standing on as a floor was burning onto my bed. Oh, my God. And uh, I grabbed the cat that was there, almost paralysed. I grabbed my passport and I ran outside and all this sacred geometry, glass, God knows what was crashing all around me. I ran out down the pathway, looked back and it was an A-frame. And as I looked there, it it's imploded and all the windows went in and out through the top it erupted just like Krakatoa where we'd been filming only three months earlier. And uh, the firemen turned up and the only thing they rescued from it was like this polyvinyl blackened meteorite uh, of slides. And they gave it to me and I dragged it around for a few days. It was solid as a rock. So this is like a, a whole bunch of slides that That's are basically right. melted together right. into a, a right. solid right. rock. That's exactly right. <laughs> and after a oh, while, tragic. I thought, well, I'll give it a crack. And I began, uh, well, first of all, with an axe and then with saws and then with little knives. And we eventually discovered that in the heart of it, there were at least 200 perfectly preserved slides. Oh, wow. And radiating out from that in different states of, stages of transformation were slides that had been, well... They respond, these colour slides, to the uh, extinguishing agent in the farmer's hoses by f transforming in the most extraordinary ways. Oh, it didn't wow. like just burning a slide with a candle as we used to do in the old days. It's changed their colours. And these things I have lost for years and years, and they've just come back to me. So I'm on the brink of making an exhibition of these extraordinary images. I was about images. to say, this has got to be something that now would be such an incredible well, thing to display yes, somewhere. Because it is the images of a vanishing world, mm. you know, on a warming planet. Mm. And those things are going forever. We'll never see them again. So it is extraordinary how it's all come back to me uh, hundreds of years later. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like a metaphor in itself, isn't it? it like is having all those memories burnt together and into a time time capsule that so now you can open up and use as a metaphor exactly as a whole. Right. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I mean... Keep your eyes open open to that. I'm not sure what we're going to call it yet, but yeah. uh, it'll be apparent. That will be some something you'll do here and... In... Well, it'll be... Already people are interested in doing it in, in London, New, New wow. York, and in Santa Monica, in, in the States. Oh, but great. yes, I'll be putting it together here, doing all the hard work Nice. Here. So over, overall, like, I mean, this whole quest to understand the things of, you know, the unknown source of life and and uh, the whole thing beyond scientific realms mm. that, that you've been pushing for. What what has been your kind of, your conclusion over the years? Is there, has there been a specific light bulb moment or has it been over these years of travelling that you've sort of come to a conclusion of how you feel or what you feel lies beyond us? <laughs> Well, well, I think what I might have learned is that the, as the mystics and gurus have always said in the East, they've said that the only real adventure is the adventure inwards of self-discovery. It's okay to get all this outer adventure done when you're young, but it only is a mirror, uh, 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 a, a sort of fake image of what is going on inside us. Mm. And uh, I'm more convinced than ever that this is a more mysterious phenomena than we have any idea of, which the left brain of science has no claim on being able to explain to us yet. I think there's a lot of truth in that we exteriorize what we think is the truth, that we do live in a world of maya, of illusion, of mm. delusion, and that the clearest way out of that is, in fact, inwards. Mm. And it's worth doing a bit of inwards work. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they lift their weight, they, do their, they look after their bodies and lift weights and go through all that sort of stuff. But it's worth putting time, as the Balinese do. Uh, not all of them, of course. A lot of them are just caught up in the habit side of it. But there are definitely people throughout Indonesia, more than us in the West, who put time and effort into becoming more awake more conscious. Mm. Because I like that early saying of the Indian gurus, man, you are asleep, must you die before you're awake. Mm. It is interesting that so often it takes being put into extreme uncom uncomfortable situations or, uh, or even spending years searching for things that are exterior before you come to a point where you realise that you're not 
something within isn't being fixed or healed. Yes. And, um, because you don't find it outside in the way we think, you know. Yeah. Be careful, beware what you wish for and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think there's a real <laughs> balance between, you know, wanting to seek adventure and not wanting to just live a life, you know, too ordinary, you know, because that's, that's the general path that we're told to travel on is a life very ordinary. So living a life less ordinary is such a beautiful, incredible thing, you know, mm. just mm. to fill our lives with, and to stretch our lives with more memories too mm. because mm. life really does feel longer the more memories you pack it with. <laughs> so you've got that but then in that search and that quest for adventure, you really, it's, it sort of seems to be what leads you back into yourself. I mean, I know that even for myself, I mean, I'm 40, 45 and, you know, for years struggled with different things within and, and it wasn't until um, even, you know, my classic, the classic midlife crisis moment in, in when I hit 40, um, did I, as much as I've always pondered on, on the inner workings of our mind and, and spirituality and all those things, it, it still didn't really make sense mm. to me until I um, started some breathing exercises and mm. meditation mm. when I hit 40 to try and calm myself mm. down within, to stop stressing That's and right, being depressed. That's right, you have depressed. to do it. It's no good just thinking about it. Absolutely, yeah. one has to do it. Yeah, it really is. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and, and often I find that, that people like yourself that have, had such wild adventures and really pushed pushed those boundaries physically. Um, you know, when you really reflect on it, that's often what it comes back to is that inner inner journey. Yeah, I think that's where the action is. You did. I remember you mentioned in um, how are we going for time? Not too good. Okay, could, we'll wrap it up soon. Okay, well I'll ask ask one more thing. I, just in terms of your past, like I di- I remember in the um, in your book uh, Ry- Rhythms of Vision. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's the one, the forward by Lyle Watson. Yeah, I actually read that forward. I just hadn't Mm. made the connection with him. Um, So I remember when you described, like I'm sort of fascinated by that, that, the group that you were talking about, the meditation group and the the experience the man that led it had and then you were drawn to it and then it's amazing to me that you ended up being in a position where you were invited by them to be in a situation where you accepted that passing on of what – I don't know how to what I don't want to call it a conversion again, but mm. but uh, I remember you were saying you're standing in like a hall and you're and you're with a bunch of these people that practice this art, and uh, and you are about to sort of be led into accepting what they mm-hmm. have tapped into, and you said that you were terrified and that you were terrified of that there was a fear there of opening yourself up to something, and that you were f- that you were op- may- terrified of opening up a chasm that you had sort of buried since your childhood. What was that chasm that you buried in your childhood and did you have a, a connection to kind of spirituality or anything as a child that made you fear it? Well, I can't quite remember what you're talking about because I did write that book <laughs> in 1971. Like, well, I just read it recently, uh, but, so but, <laughs> I'm just going to pull out your history. <laughs> but but I, I do remember what you're talking about, about being fearful because I was asked, you're asked to completely surrender I mean, there's no contact between you and the other people you're doing it with. You know, you're in your own separate little spaces, except you're in the same room. But you are required to completely surrender. I mean, who in their right minds surrenders to something they don't know what it is? Um, So I suppose suppose the thing in my earliest childhood was, was fear. I am a war baby. I was uh, born in 1942 and the bombs were still dropping for another couple of years, two or three years, so there was great fear around one, uh, like a sea washing around. But yes, I come from a fey family of people who've been more interested in what is the, the more important aspects of life. They were more interested in experience than in things. And they were more interested, my mother particularly was um, addicted to finding conscious people, as Mm. she put it, and would go to great trouble and go all around the world and live in ashrams for extended periods of time and give it her absolute all. Wow. And she was rather unusual because she didn't, as so many of us do, uh, once they find something that they think works, cling to it, come hell or high water, uh, become fanatical about it. None of that. She was after the essence and found bits of this essence in all the teachings and in all ways of experiencing lives. But there is uh, 
uh, that that runs in my family, I guess. Yeah, that, I mean that's in, that's great. That's Lucky. what a fantastic addiction for a, a parent to have and bestow upon yes. their children. And you know, to, yes, and, you know I, that I, sort of that, I owe them a lot. Yeah, well, that makes more sense to me. What where you, where Lorne and yourself got that desire and that burning passion mm-hmm. for going and finding the unknown. Um, I know you've got to run, but I'm so glad. You stopped by it's and it's so good pleasure. to meet you. Thank I'd love you. to do this again sometime Absolutely. if you're around. We're both around. Cool. So, yeah. no, it's been a trip. Yeah, it's been Lawrence, well thank done. you so much for dropping in. Thank you for and, doing uh, all your homework too. Bless yeah. you too. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.